I just want to introduce um, Dr. Louis to the group. Um, so Dr. Vivian Louis is an associate professor and deputy chief of, for cancer biology and experimental therapeutics of biomedical sciences at the Chinese University in Hong Kong. Um, uh, she obtained her PhD in molecular pharmacology at the University of Pittsburgh, um, working with Jenny Granditz, uh, followed by a postdoctoral um, fellowship at Duke University. Um, she was the first one to discover the clinical drug ability of the PI3 kinase pathway and the MAP, uh, MAP kinase mutations in head and neck cancer. Um, currently, her research is focused on pharmacogenomics and immunogenomics for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma and nasopharyngeal carcinoma uh, using integrative omics and clinical big data. Dr. Louis is the program leader of a pan-cancer precision medicine research program grant and the PI of multiple academic grants in gene drug sensitivity studies um, uh, at Chinese University. Uh, she's received 18 awards and fellowships, um, including the United College uh, Early Career Research Excellence Award from Chinese University Hong Kong um, and the uh, SH Ho Visiting Professorship uh, uh, for Stanford as uh, a Stanford Chinese University Exchange Program. Um, she's published over 102 uh, articles uh, in high profile journals such as Cancer Discovery, Nature Communications, JAMA Oncology, PNAS, uh, JCI, JCI, and uh, Clinical Cancer Research. And um, she's a good friend of uh, Quinn Lee's, and um, we're uh, very excited to hear her. Uh, uh, give a talk on her current research. Dr. Okay. Lee. Uh, thank you so much and uh, for your nice introduction. And I think uh, I was just start um, talking, uh, giving this talk uh, with a share PowerPoint, if I may. Okay. Um, so I'm going to share with you today on the MAP kinase pathway operations in head and neck cancer that we recently published uh, about its therapeutics and immunogenomics. This is my uh, conflict of interest declarations. Um, so um, as you're an expert in the head and neck cancer field, uh, but uh, this is just a simple introductory slide talking about head and neck cancer incidence is actually uh, rising all the way up to 0.83 million uh, per year. And uh, you all know that this uh, devastating cancer actually have a poor survival rate, depends on the cancer site, uh, of a five-year survival uh, about 50% or less sometimes, and also depends on the locality. Now, also, um, the two-year recurrence rate is high because of the few cancerization that the head and neck um, epithelium are always exposed to carcinogen. And uh, with that, uh, oops, this slide, sorry, click the wrong button. So the two years uh, recurrence rate is about 60%. Now I just wanna highlight uh, in this figure that uh, the epithelium of the nasal, uh, of the head neck region actually is for, uh, could be exposed to carcinogen uh, in the next slide. But uh, in terms of classification, there are virally related head and neck cancer, which is uh, here as shown in the nasopharynx, uh, the Epstein-Barr virus positive or associated nasopharyngeal cancer, which uh, we recently published about actually two or three years ago, that nf cover b pathway operations are responsible for the majority of these cases um, for carcinogenesis for this cancer. Whereas nearby in the oropharynx, uh, HPV, human papilloma virus, uh, associated with cancer of this, and it's actually uh, getting very uh, endemic and in Europe and as well as the United States. Now then, uh, the rest of the cancer, most of the cancers are actually non-virally associated. Now, um, Now, the, there is actually a wide range of etiological factors associated with head and neck cancer, well known to be smoking and drinking. Uh, if you are a severe, uh, actually a heavy drinker and smoker, you have 30, 30 times higher risk of developing head and neck cancer. 
Now then, uh, what I just shared uh, are the oncogenic viruses, the HPV and Epstein Barr virus. Now, beetle nut, uh, beetle nut uh, sniffing and smoking are actually related to a high risk of oral cancer development. Now, we still don't know yet uh, the long-term effect of e-cigarettes, uh, but you know, hopefully, uh, I guess probably in a decade or two, we'll see the effect of such an uh, e-cigarettes on the uh, possible incidents, uh, you know, on head and neck cancer. Air pollution, the particular matters, as well as the organic chemicals in the air pollutants are actually known to cause high uh, incidence of head and neck cancer, especially in India, in certain parts of Asia, air pollution is actually heavy. Now, Fanconi anemia um, is known. A uh, patient with this Fanconia anemia disease is known to have about 400 times higher risk of developing head and neck cancer. Now, last but not least, the poor oral hygiene. Uh, people are developing hypotheses that uh, the microbiome uh, that could be causing head and neck cancer as well. I always put, as a scientist, I will always put a question mark because there are always unknown factors. Now, um, the head and neck cancer, if you're aware of patients who have head and neck cancer or who are surviving with head and neck cancer actually have the second highest suicidal rates among pain cancer. Now, pancreatic cancer, the most painful cancer of all, actually have one of the highest suicidal mortality rates, but this is second by head and neck cancer. Even though the incidence of head and neck cancer is about 20%, 26% higher, than pancreatic cancer, but the frequency of suicide is about 334%. Now, partly because of the very compromised quality of life, uh, despite very good surgery, but those surgery are usually very uh, disfiguring on the facial feature of the patients, as well as a uh, change of the living habits, the quality of life, basically, of patients are putting a very high burden on the patient's, uh, on the patient's psychology. Now, uh, with regard to treatment, I'm sorry that the Zoom bar is blocking the title a little bit, uh, but with regard to treatment, this is the timeline showing the development of head and neck cancer therapy. The chemotherapies, the Splatin, Plaquitaxels, and 5-FUs are the ones that have been used for a while, for a long time, for the treatment of head and neck cancer. 2006, Cetuximab, the anti-EGFR antibody, has been introduced for refractory metastatic head and neck cancer. Yet, um, the, um, the response, the clinical response, is, uh, actually remains to be moderate. Until 2016, uh, that prembolizumab and nivolumab, the PD, uh, PD-1 inhibitor, uh, has been approved by the FDA for the treatment of a very aggressive metastatic recurrent head and neck cancer. Now, um, the, um, the percent of patient responsive to uh, this immunotherapy uh, rather decent, uh, anywhere higher than 25 to close to sometimes uh, 30%. It depends on the, uh, on the patient um, uh, immunogenomics, I would say. Now, which I will share with you a little bit later. Now, and then during which uh, what, uh, we are hoping that the FDA, you know, it is in the fast track destination that Tipiferinib, which is known to be effective in about 53% of uh, head and neck cancer patients uh, with HRAS mutation. So hopefully this will be in the clinic soon, uh, really uh, crossing our fingers. Now the other uh, therapies that pan cancer, tissue agonistic um, pan cancer approval by the FDA are actually larotractinib, uh, targeting and track fusion, which is actually common in some kind of salivary blood cancer and antractinib uh, for Rosman fusion uh, genes that are detected in any cancers, including a very small subset of patients in head and neck cancer. Now, uh, as you can view from here, the treatment is uh, actually advancing, but still the number of patients that could benefit from these treatments remain to be limited. This is a famous um, cartoon. Actually, this is a famous uh, landscape of the head and neck cancer published in 2015 in Nature by the TCGA group. Uh, you can actually uh, easily understand from here uh, that among the significantly mutated genes that are found in head and neck cancer, if you call by their names, uh, you, know, you understand that most of them are actually tumor suppressor genes. 
that cannot be effectively targeted, except for the fact that pic 3 ca were the ones that we actually first harnessed uh, for therapeutic potential, and then uh, followed by HRAS. So uh, most tumor suppressor genes cannot be uh, actually druggable at this moment, uh, even though a lot of efforts has been put. So um, therefore we build on the idea that if a cancer cell uh, of a specific cancer type like head neck cancer, they seem to have a common pathway that allow them to survive. Now, if in any way that we can find identify those addictive pathways that are essential for survival of the cancer cells of the head and neck, then we may be able to harness uh, treatment to uh, find treatment for them for a larger population of patients. Therefore, uh, back in 2013, we started the pathway-centric analysis uh, using the omics data for uh, translational precision medicine development. These are the old publications that we had, but we, um, we all believe that, you know, back to a decade ago, we all believe that the JAK-STAT pathway is the most important growth-related pathway for head and neck cancer. Now, when we first harnessed the 151 whole exome sequencing data of the head and neck, uh, we actually found that uh, we have been wrong. We have been looking at the wrong pathway, but instead the PI3K pathway aberrations uh, identify in almost one third of head and neck cancer patients. And it's even higher to about 50% of head and neck cancer patients if they are HPV positive. So uh, these patients all have advanced head, advanced head and neck cancer, especially if they have multiple uh, aberrations of the PI3K pathways. So they were really the first to be targeted. Now, I'm not going to show you too much of the results of the past papers, but this was the first that we uh, actually put patients' tumor as a PDX, patient-derived xenograft, into the mice and test that and show that uh, pic 3 c mutated patient tumor grafts are actually responsive to an experimental drug of the PI3K inhibitor at that time. The tumor actually responds really well uh, to the PI3K inhibitor, whereas the patient's graft with the what type PIK3CA gene did not respond to the PI3K inhibitors. Now with that result, um, there are actually a few clinical trials that are still going on in the US. Um, so now then um, that is the PI3K pathway. And I really want to focus today's talk on the MAPK pathway, which is well known to be the ERK pathway uh, for mitogenic for growth of head and neck cancer as well as other cancer. I'm going to share with you the story where we go from one patient's exception response to many possibly uh, to harness this pathway for treatment. Now the PI3K path, uh, the MAPK pathway, the MAP kinase pathway is actually well known. Uh, when patients have germline mutations of this pathway, they are known to have a syndrome called cardiofacio-cutaneous syndrome, the CFC syndrome. This Noonan syndrome, Costello syndrome, and all the syndrome that I show you here with the pictures are displaying to you that uh, patients with these germline mutations of the pathway depicted, depicted here, they have disproportional uh, growth of the facial features. Now, at the same time, they also, if the patient with this syndrome, they also somehow known to have cardio problems as well. Now, this link between the head and neck as the, and the heart is still unknown as to the cause of this syndrome. Now, nevertheless, uh, these are the essential components of the pathway. The RAS, RAF, MAP kinase, make and, uh, and also actually MAP kinase actually do translocate in nucleus to cause a bunch of uh, transcription of genes that are not fully known at this moment yet. Now, uh, with this, I hope I convinced you that the MAPK pathway defects are uh, actually affecting growth in the head and neck region. So the first case uh, was actually seen in Pittsburgh that this patient with head and neck cancer, he came into the clinic uh, actually for surgery, but he was put onto the window of opportunity trial at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, he was young and heavy smoker and drinker, developed advanced um, metastatic head and neck cancer. Now he was given a lot in it. 
an EGFR kinase inhibitor for just 13 days. His pre biopsy was taken after 13 days. He went to his surgery room. The clinician called the lab and asked what had been done on this patient because his primary lesion was gone. And the 38 lymph nodes that were taken out uh, were all tumor negative. So he, he was basically having no evidence of disease for 30 some months or so uh, by the time that we reported his case. Now at that time, uh, um, we collaborated with Harvard with Van Allen and we published this paper and showing that uh, we, were, we were trying to harness the genomic data of this patient to see why he responds to a lot of it, a drug that is known seems to be useless in head and neck cancer patients. Now, um, to cut the story short, basically this is also uh, leading to an MAPK clinical trial uh, in, in, in uh, UCSF right now for, um, for um, pediatric cancer. Now, what I want to show you is what we found at the beginning. So MAPK1 uh, was not the first suspect that we thought is, uh, is causing uh, so, uh, sensitivity to a lot of it in this patient. Now, nevertheless, we finished the whole exome sequencing with the uh, original biopsy of the patients, and we found no EGFR amplification, no EGFR mutation, which is the target of allotinib. So without those luck, um, I went ahead and did a network analysis, asking the question if there's no EGFR after alterations, this patient is responsive to allotinib there must be something network to EGFR pathway that is causing such an addiction to the EGFR pathway. That's very good response in the patient. Now, all of the 66 non-synonymous mutation we reported in the patient, and after a nice of, uh, I, uh, analysis, I finally I analyzed the data and found that this has to be the one. This is the only network genes that are associated with the EGFR pathway map kinase 1, which is known by its name, ERP2. Uh, this particular mutation and also validated in a way that with the pharmacogenomic analysis of all his mutation, there are only four possible druggability candidates. Now, MAPK1 is being one of the top candidates. Now, we analyzed the data further. We found that this particular mutation at E322 position that is mutated to K is actually residing in a very conserved domain of the MAPK pathway, right outside the kinase domain of MAPK1. Now, in fact, mapping these mutations uh, in pain cancer genomic data seems to show that this is really a hot spot. Now, followed by other hot spots next to it, and also hot spot clusters around the uh, MAPK here. So we showed the results that you know um, there is one endogenous cell line, uh, cell line that is from Japan that have this endogenous mutation showing very high level of fossil EGFR confirming a hypothesis that that could be an addiction to the EGFR pathway, given that even though this is not a mutation of EGFR, but it's downstream, it's downstream gene. Now then, uh, and with further uh, analysis that is published in uh, 2016, we found that actually this mutation is causing a high level of amphiraclin, which is the ligand of EGFR being produced in those cells that have MAPK1 mutation. By knocking down the ligand by SHRNA, you can see that a lot in the response uh, basically is actually brought down to nothing when we knock down the AR, the amphiraclin gene, confirming that amphiraclin is responsive to such uh, a high responsiveness to a lot of it with this mutation. Then in 2016, the clinical, uh, the 2017, the clinical trial result has been published. What was found is actually uh, the first time showing that MAPK's kinase pathway activity is related to clinical response to allotinib. As shown in this graph, the basal MAPK kinase activity um, is possibly correlated to tumor size, confirming the growth promoting activity of MAPK activation in head and neck tumor. Now, but if the patients are being treated with allotinib with this dark line here, 
you can see that the higher level of fossil map kinase are actually indicating a decline and lower tumor size of the patients. First confirming the activity of adme PK kinase is really responsible for the activity uh, for uh, allotting the treatment. Now, so this year we published another paper trying to look at other cluster. We look at a mutation right next to this hotspot, which also is common in head neck, as well as a cluster here uh, around the uh, middle of the kinase domain shown here. It's trying to see whether there could be other allotin sensitivity uh, mutation that could be harnessed for precision medicine of head neck cancer. This is the TCGA data showing almost universally mutations of the mutations that we reported in the exceptional responder, which is actually good news, mostly in the oral cavity and some in the larynx. Now in the Hong Kong cohort, about 105 tumors, but we identify some mutation of this hotspot, but at the same time, there are 135 and other hotspots as well as next to it, the D321, are actually occurring at a rate that is higher than what we observe in the TCGA, around 3.325% of head neck cancer patients in Hong Kong. And these patients actually have recurrent head neck. Now we did X-ray crystallography mapping, trying to see the spatial relationship of these mutation sites. This is the hotspot mutation we reported earlier. It's nearby amino acid 321, of course, it's next to it. But the R135 cluster is actually residing very close to this, and they are all in a domain called kinase interacting motif, exposing to an interacting surface outside, facing outside of the map kinase. That means this region, when it's mutated, is probably disrupting a lot of downstream or even upstream um, substrates or downstream effectors of the map kinase. Now, nevertheless, what we did is we actually introduced this mutation into the same cell that we did for the head and neck cancer report that we have before and found that this mutation, especially the 3 2, 1 mutation, is causing upregulation of EGF, also EGFR moderately followed by the other hotspot mutation. Now, in the end, we proceed to the animal study and show that the wild type MAPK1 gene did not cause phospho EGFR activation nor any response to allotinib. Whereas the activation, activating kinase show a huge increase in phospho EGFR activation, as well as very impressive allotinib responsiveness whereas uh, the other mutation is causing a significant more, a, a trend for uh, reduction in tumor size or p-value of equals to 0.06. Now, this is another staining showing cytokeratin, showing that uh, in this hotspot uh, mutated uh, tumors, the allotin treatment has resulted in tremendous increase in non-tumor staining area consistent with the shrinkage of the tumor whereas the wild type tumor did not show any change. Now, so this is a good news, telling us that another mutation, and possibly if we carefully characterize the rest of the other cluster mutations of the MAP kinase, there could be a way to harness MAPK1 gene uh, alterations in hand neck cancer for a lot in the treatment. Now then, we ask the question, so we know MAPK pathway is activating most of the time by HRAS, and by BRAF in other cancers. Now then, uh, how about what will be the biological roles of MAPK pathway mutations and what will be the clinical implication for patients having this mutation? We published this paper uh, two months ago and show that, uh, just uh, summarized here, the MAPK pathway mutations and neck cancer actually did shape the tumor immune microenvironment of head and neck, and it has an indication for immunotherapy for head and neck cancer patients. And it also inhibit or free signaling, uh, having indications for precision medicine, not to use indication for ERP3, possibly, uh, for ERP3 inhibitors. Now, this is showing you uh, that the updated percent aberration in TCGA cohort is close to 19% for this pathway. Now, so the first question to ask, we did a pen cancer path, pen pathway analysis to see that which pathway is worth 
uh, going after in terms of therapy and further analysis for its mechanisms of actions in the head and neck. So we did seven pathway analysis and found that MAPK pathway alteration is the only pathway of these seven pathway we look at pointing towards a counterintuitive better survival of the patients. Knowing that MAPK pathway is a mitogenic growth promoting pathway in cancer, we were surprised by this finding that how would MAPK pathway active a mutation actually causing good survival? In fact, a lot of these mutations are known to be activating either. Now then the NOSH pathway as published by a Taiwanese group earlier is known to be associated with poor survival in head and neck cancer patients. This is the Kleppenmeier's curve showing the almost the doubling of better survival of MAPK mutated patients in the TCGA cohort. Now, when we look at stratification with P53 mutation, which is known to be a bad prognostic factor, patient with P53 mutation survive poorly. Now, we were surprised to find that with the double mutation of P53 and the MAPK pathway, Mutations, patients are really surviving very well, much better than the, uh, and, than the wild type MAPK patients, even with P53 stratification. Then I talked to my graduate student, Jason. He just graduated with his PhD uh, last month and I said, okay, let's look further. I don't believe in our data because MAPK pathway at least is dominated by activating mutants of the HRAS, of the G12, G13 the MAPK mutation we published earlier, and the BRAF mutations known in, in uh, melanoma activating. So then we look at subsites. HPV positivity is known to be associated with good prognosis as published by everybody. Then we look at the subsite distribution of MAPK pathway mutated tumors. Um, in fact, there's no bias towards oropharyngeal. There's only 9% of these patients having oropharyngeal cancer. The rest are in the oral cavity in the larynx and hypopharynx. So, and then we look at the clinical pathological factors. The only factors that seems to be associated are less uh, in the MAPK mutation, in the mutated patients, less of the drinking history, and also more of the female patients. Now, these are the Club and Myers curve showing the rest of the other pathways. There are potential effects in the jack step, but it's not nearly making significance here. None of the pathways are making significance in terms of survival um, impact on head and neck cancer patients. We asked the questions, would that better survival due to just a high mutational burden, test the possibility of a higher new antigen produced and more and, you know, anti-tumor effect being uh, endogenous in the patient. In fact, none of these pathways differ in terms of the mutational burden, except for HPV positive cancer patients, they have less of the mutational burden, which is well known. Now then we ask, let's look at not just the genome, but also the transcriptome to see if that is telling us the same thing. We look at overexpressions of the kinases, the major kinase, RAF1, MAP kinase, and the S6 kinase. And they all, when they are overexpressed, that means activation of the pathway. Patients survive really well. And we look at all the kinases in the pathway, the same thing happened. Then we asked more, I said, I really don't believe so, uh, to Jason. And then he did the analysis of the adapter molecules, GRAP2, SHIP3. When they're overexpressed, you know, we can hypothesize that the whole thing can be more well established for the activation of the pathway. They all point to better survival of the patients. There are inactive regulators of the MAP kinase specifically for activation. DUPS3, DUPS5, and DUPS9. These are the, the uh, phosphatase that takes away the fossil growth of ERK. Then we see that if they are downregulated, that means the pathway of ERK can be activated. In fact, the downregulated patients all have better survival. I said, all right, the data could be true. Let's have an independent cohort to validate it. We took the MSK impact cohort, patients of all advanced metastatic head and neck cancer patients. We look at the pathway mutant patient, they all survive better. So with this independent cohort, 
I start to believe that what we're finding is true. And we also see the same thing in the endometrial cancer patients survive much better with the MAPK pathway mutations. Then the first legitimate question to ask is, are the MAPK pathway mutants actually causing drug sensitivity? Because the TCGA cohort survival is largely dominated by chemotherapy and at most cetuximab. So what we're seeing here, we saw, uh, we harnessed data of our in-house as well as the CCLE published data. And we found that none of the chemotherapy and cetuximab is showing a trend for a slight reduction in terms of the drug doses for responsiveness. So I said, so it is not due to an increased sensitivity of the drug by this pathway mutants. We did in-house analysis. I'm not uh, showing you the data. It's basically showing the same thing. Now, what we did is after transcription, we look at protein, the cancer protein atlas data of 250 signaling proteins one by one. Now, what we summarize here is the head and neck cancer data unpublished. But what we see here, there are 19 proteins showing good survival or best survival uh, impact on head and neck cancer patients, two of which, BRAF and ARAF, are pointing towards better survival. Now, when we did the pan cancer analysis, this is true for another additional 10 cancer types that the pathway mutants of the MAPK in the proteum are indicating good survival. Whereas the rest are showing both good or bad survival depends on the candidates that you're looking at or no effect on survival in other cancers. Now then we asked a question and Jason, my graduate student, uh, did the transcriptal analysis and found one thing um, that the raglan, which is a ligand for activation of the Earth 3 pathway, it seems to be downregulated in patients of the MAPK mutated patient. Now then, we went back to look at the protein. ERP3 is actually the first protein when you have overexpression, then you have very poor survival of the patient of the head and neck. That means if this pathway is being suppressed, patient could have a better chance of surviving. So we look at the protein, protein uh, data from the head and neck as the patient and found that when you have increased expression of BRAF protein, there is actually a negative correlation that is a reduction of possible Earth 3 level in the patient's tumor. We kind of mimic what it, it could happen and by introducing the wild type and the mutant, activating mutant of BRAF into head and neck cancer cells, FADU, and we found that the wild type, as the data suggests here, really suppress Earth 3 signaling to 50% whereas the BRAF mutant further suppresses to almost 70% of activation status of ERT3. This is one gene, one protein, and we look at the entire pathway. HRAS, downregulating ERT3 with activating mutation, MIG1, the wild type itself suppress and the mutant suppress further. MIG2, the mutant have a better suppression, and the wild type does a little bit. MAPK mutations really suppresses it, and then ARAF, one of the mutations did nothing, but the other mutations, actually also a hotspot, also suppressed fossil Earth 3. We were convinced that this is a pathway that is known to suppress Earth 3 now. What we did is further harness the CCLE data by looking at the MAP kinase mutated patients, uh, mutated cell lines, and we find a very strong negative correlation between fossil Earth 3 and MAPK activation. Then we reason that if we suppress MAPK activation by inhibitor, we will see an increase in fossil Earth 3 activation in these cells. In fact, we use a primary cultures of the patients in the lab and the cell line with MAPK1 mutation. And we found that if we put in a MAP kinase inhibitor, there is an increase, significant increase, significant increase in the level of fossil Earth 3. Now, this is not found in the wild type cells that there's no um, inverse, inverse relationship in the activation. That means this relationship of MAP kinase activation dictating of tree signaling is only specific for MAPK mutated head and neck cells. We went to see the patient cohort 
we identify tumors from, uh, from Hong Kong that have high LO frequency of RAS, MAP kinase mutation over 30%, and they all express low level of fossil ER3 compared to WAP type tumors that have high membranous staining of ER3. So now we know that this is one of the mechanisms contributing potentially to better survival of the patients. I talked to Jason and I said, I'm not satisfied with that. That doesn't explain the whole picture, I believe. So one night we were doing a differential gene expression for all immune genes. These are the immune genes that are displayed here for analysis. We found that I hope you can appreciate from this uh, heat maps, the mammy PK mutated patients tumor from the wild type very, uh, actually different very much in terms of the immune gene signature. One night I was sitting in the sofa and tried to look at all these 400 genes one by one. Uh, by the time I did 100, uh, completed 100 genes, over 70 of them are actually immune uh, related gene related to CD8 activity. So I told my postdoc, let's do a uh, enrichment assay analysis. And we found that the top four genes that are enriched for functional, functionality are immune related, defense, immune, immune system, and cytokines. So, and we dig further. Using timer analysis uh, published by Shirley Liu at Harvard, we did this transcriptome analysis for MAPK mutated tumors versus the wild type. And we found that there are actually significant increase in CD8 infiltration level, together with higher dendritic cells, the antigen pretending cell level, and the immune regulators, neutral fields. And at the same time, we found that the MAPK mutated tumors have an indicators of high CD8 activity shown by proferrin granzyme increases all across four out of the five granzymes known to be related to immune activation. Now then we ask further, how about the specific cytolytic scores, that is the cytolytic scores, T effector scores, and interferon gamma score that are known to be associated with CD8 activity. In fact, they are all significantly elevated in MAPK tumors. It just indicated that the MAPK mutated tumor seems to have a high activation of the CD8 activity in situ. Now then we did all the pathway, all seven pathway, and try to see which one are activating the immune profile of the head and neck tumors. Now, in fact, we could only find MAPK mutated tumors having activation increases of CD8 inflammation status together with the uh, CD8 activity scores. Some are in some other pathway like NF-CoPP for HPE positive, JAK-STAT, and potentially PI3K pathway but not activating as much on the immune activation score. Now with these three scores alone, patients that are having high score of the top 20 percentile, they all actually survive really well without reaching the median survival in the TCGA cohort. We did the um, clustering and we found that the CD8, all these immune scores, dendritic cells and neutral field are all clustered together whereas the B cells and the macrophage and CD4 are on the other side of the cluster. Now then we stained the Hong Kong tumors. Actually, I'm just showing you one in the paper. We show three, four tumors. Whenever we see a MAPK mutation, we see CD8, dendritic cells, neutral field intrafusion. But then in the mutant, in the wild type tumors, they, basically they are quite quiet in terms of those activity. this ball. Now, then I said, let's go and really test are the mutations driving CD8 infiltration in the tumor directly or indirectly. Now, what we did is we engineered the murine, the mouse version of the MAPK mutant. The RAS becomes a 312, the MAPK is 319, and the 322 becomes a 320 in the mouse version of the gene and inoculate into SV7 of the uh, of the mouse models in immunocompetent head and neck tumor models. As you can appreciate from this staining that with the wild type being inoculated, there's no infiltration, but RAS mutant, MAPK mutant, actually have a heavy staining of the CD8 infiltration. I told my uh, students, say there are, seems to be some necrotic area. Let's stain for 
um, dead cells. And in fact, the mutants are showing higher increases in dead cells in the tumor of these mice. So now we can conclude that the MAPK mutant is not just shaping the immune activity by attracting CD8 dendritic cell and neutrophil, creating an immune hot environment, but also affecting the Earth 3 signaling. Therefore, the two are a contributing factor to patients' best, uh, good survival. Now, Diane, I asked the question. This is actually the mechanism, the basis for immunotherapy as of now, at least, the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. So then we look at further into the cohort. And then we ask the question, what is really the implication for MAPK mutant patients on possibly for CD8-based, uh, T-cell-based immunotherapy like the immunotherapy inhibitors? We look at the large 1,600 patient cohort of the TMB published by Sam Stein. And another cohort that is published by Mao in the MSS cohort with 249 head and neck cancer uh, patients. Now, what we found is surprisingly, patients with the MAPK pathway mutation, they do actually two times better in terms of survival than patients without these mutations. Now, remember, these patients exhaust all treatment and they were only on the immunotherapy alone as the last option. This is the same, actually, found in the other cohort of the MSS. Then we ask the following question. Even though tumor mutational burden is not the best marker, but nevertheless, it's approved by the FDA for immune checkpoint molecules. Now then, this high mutational burden patient is uh, actually about 20% in the TMB cohort by Samstein. And we look at the TMB low cohort, and we found 26% of patients carrying MAPK pathway mutations. And in fact, these patients, the pink line, is showing much better survival than the green line here when patients have MAPK mutations versus the wild type in the low mutational burden group, which in statistical significance. Now, this is pan cancer. We believe our implications have uh, our finding have implications for pain cancer. This is well published by, uh, uh, by this report in Scientific Reports 2019. Patients with HPV positive head neck cancer are in immune inflamed with good responses to ICI. Uh, by multiple study, is showing favorable outcome. Now, this, this immune inflamed status includes CD8 inflammation, of course. So we harness this data of the TCGA further, looking at 30 some of the immune checkpoint molecule expressions in the MAPK mutated patients versus the wild type. And in fact, what we found out is we have a higher level, higher level of the CD274 uh, expressions related to the PD-1, PD-L1 immunotherapy outcome. Now you can appreciate LAC3 is also increased and also IDO1 and some of the other immune-related uh, immunosuppressive molecules are elevated in this group of patients. With this is transcriptum data, we harness the proteomic data and show that PDL1 expression at protein level is increased in the TCGA, TCPA tumor when they have MAPK pathway mutation. Now this, uh, we are preparing another manuscript on this. Now we ask the question further. The patients so far unbiasedly is not treated by us, oral cancer patients of the TMB cohort, and also metastatic head and neck cancer patients of the cohort, reaching about 50 cases in each of the case. And we found that MAPK mutation actually indicate two to three times or four times better survival than the wild type patients in this really end-stage patients. When we publish, when we try to publish the paper, the reviewer asks us to do one more analysis to see an independent analysis other than the timer analysis from uh, the Harvard group. And we, we analyzed per these findings on the annual oncology by Chen et al. We also found that the MAPK mutated patients is actually classified as a real hot class 
indicating that the immune infiltration by our experimental model as well as human tumor data is showing an immune heart feature, possibly relating to the clinical outcome of a better survival or response to ICI. Now then we've asked the last question, uh, the TMB high and the MAPK mutated patient co-occur uh, in the oral cancer and metastatic head and neck cancer cohort that I showed you. The fact is they are not. They are not significantly co-occurring with an non-significant p-value. That means that in the TMB low patient, probably they have a large percentage of patients having MAPK mutation in oral cancer as well as metastatic cancer. So uh, we are hoping that at some point, uh, we're doing further analysis to see whether we could look at more response data uh, from the ICI treatment uh, with collaborations, see whether the MAPK mutant can be further validated even in a third cohort. Now, this is coming to the end of my talk. And actually, we previously published that the NNKP, NNKPA B pathway, the inflammatory pathway, is essential for nasopharyngeal cancer carcinogenesis. Now, it should be the number one pathway that should be targeted in terms of percentage of patients for NPC. Now, but if you look at the three pathways together, we published this in uh, in cancers uh, earlier. The three major pathway that should be really drug for HPV negative. HPV positive, as well as NPC are largely overlapping to be the nf b PI3K, and MAPK pathway. We hope that in the future, we can really uh, perform larger drug screen on patient-derived cells, uh, which is happening in the lab right now. So uh, I want to put this as a conclusion slide. We harness the genomic or mixed profile of the head and neck cancer patients trying to identify possible treatment. And some has been into the clinical trial and hopefully in the future immunotherapy trial uh, here in Asia. Now, um, I hope I convinced you that MAPK pathway is highly druggable in addition to the PI3K pathway. And in particular, the MAPK1 gene, the ERP2 gene, uh, if we dissect it more carefully, uh, it causes, if those mutation causes high activation of ERK or MAPK1 protein activity, it will be related to a high activity against, uh, uh, I mean, high responsiveness to allotinib. So this pathway approach that I share with you today, I hope that you see it to be useful uh, when it's integrated with the omics and survival data for precision medicine development for head and neck cancer and possibly other cancers as well. Um, last but not least, I want to acknowledge my group here, very young uh, generation of scientists. Uh, Jason is the one who uh, did his PhD uh, thesis on two of the MAP kinase study I presented today. And uh, he's going to spend a postdoc year in my lab uh, as we actually got a precision medicine grant. I need someone to help with the transition of this big grant before he de departs from the lab. Yu Chung, uh, Dr. Yu Chung Liu is the postdoc doing all the bioinformatics in the lab. Thomas and Pioni are the staff that are working on, that work on the uh, gene study NGS in the lab. Now I want to acknowledge funding from the Hong Kong agencies to government, the cancer fund, the uh, research grant cancer, as well as the NIH uh, that has funded our study and my collaborators uh, across in the US uh, and, and Hong Kong. Thank you very much for uh, the time uh, for listening to my talk. I will welcome any questions. Thank you. So Vivian, this is Quinn. I'm gonna have to um, ask a question. So, so if I'm interpreting this right, you're, you're linking NAPK activation with ERP uh, suppression as well as CDA uh, infiltration. Is it independent of each other? Is there a relationship? Have you looked at, you know, what happened if you block or B? What does it do to the to immune, immune microenvironment? Yes, yes. This is a good question, Quinn. Um, so in the paper, we did further analysis. I didn't have time to go through all the analysis and results. And we did the, um, the analysis for co-existent, co-occurrence. And in fact, they do not. They do not overlap. So the ERP3 activated patient seems to be different from the group that have 
the CD8 inflammation. Now, but I am, I am very careful with this statement because I searched, uh, you know, the publication. There is one publication in the world showing that there's some indication that ERF3 can be manipulating immune activity in head and neck cancer. So I, I will be very careful as a scientist to further dissect the link between the two before I claim this. But in the TCGA tumor data that we harness, they do not overlap. They do not overlap. Hi, Dr. Louie. Uh, I don't know, is my speaker on? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi. Hi I'm Dimitri Kovic, medical college. I'm wondering about the uh, cancer type agnostic observation. So if I heard you correctly and I'm interpreting your data correctly, these immune related gene signatures and increased uh, infiltration of CD8 uh, sort of was associated with the mutations in your, but I think everything we were looking at was sort of head and neck. I, beyond head and neck, is this a consistent theme or is there something specific about head and neck? I, um, yes, thank you very much for your question. Um, in fact, we were actually first surprised by this, uh, what you call tissue agonistic finding. This is pen cancer. This large cohort from the TMB published by mm -hmm. Samstein is actually pen cancer. And so is this being the pen cancer data, two independent sets. Now, of course, they could be heavily biased towards two cancer, which is lung and melanoma. So mm -hmm. that's why in the study, we further dissect it down to head and neck. Now, the fact that uh, in melanoma is well known that melanoma is one of the most uh, immunogenic kind of tumor um, that, um, you know, activation of MAP kinase is essential for uh, at least a large portion, portion of patients there for tumor genesis to melanoma and maybe related to the immune feature. Now, in lung cancer, it has been published that the RAS mutation, just on RAS mutant lung cancer, it is immune attracting. It is immune inflamed uh, in lung cancer. So we believe that what we found here, not just with our head and neck uh, data, but also with the pan cancer data, uh, I think the implication can be really outside of head and neck. Now, uh, one suspicion is the neogenicity, the antigenicity of some of these well-known mutations of the MAPK pathway, right? Uh, you know, what we believe is actually the MAPK1 mutation can be neoantigenic with testing right now, but the, uh, the BRAF mutations can be as well. So I believe that uh, the finding can be extended to pan cancer potentially. And with two large cohorts that's been published, we are harnessing more of the genome data of the ICI response, and there are more being published and we, we will definitely look into further. And it will be very nice if the prospective studies can be conducted to see the ICI responses. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Vivian, um, this is John. Uh, very nice talk and uh, very nice body of work. Um, quick question with the MAP kinase uh, one pat, uh, mutations, if you look across the, the TCGA or even within head and neck, do you see any specific mutations that tend to co-occur with the MAP kinase one mutation? Mm. I, my short answer, just out of my head right now, we look at the most prominent one, which is P53. They do not co-occur. We did a clinical pathological analysis. They actually do not co-occur all the time. Now, but of course, this is hard to say because PV3 mutation exists in about 80% of the head and neck tumors, okay? The only evidence we could find is really the lesser of the, uh, the drinking history. And uh, the, other path, the other mutations, we are, I, I don't think we have seen any other uh, mutational features that are associated with it. Now, um, but, um, but I think it is, in terms of association for druggability, I, I don't see much of the co-occurrence of the druggable gene, uh, honestly, at this point. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the reason I ask, um, and just maybe a suggestion, is that, um, you know, you see this 
you see this association between the MAP kinase one mutations and uh, the CD8 infiltration, but um, it's possible that the MAP kinase mutations are cooperating with something else, which is driving the inflammation, right? And so um, um, it just might be interesting to look at that uh, uh, to see if there's something else that's associated that might be driving uh, what you're seeing. Yes, yes, correct, correct. And that was my, actually my, que my question when I asked my uh, uh, graduate student to do the experiment for the, in the mice. I just want to make sure the only thing that we engineer is the MAP kinase mutation or HRAS mutation. And we already seen, uh, this is actually day six after inflammation, uh, when we implant the tumor uh, into the mice of the CH3 background, which is immunocompetent, we already see infiltration and some death of the tumors. So we suspect that it alone is doing its job. But what is really behind the whether it's exosome release or, or whatever. Uh, uh, and I, I actually, if you ask me for the mechanism, I actually believe what is happening is there is an actual steady turnover of cells dying, not surviving really well, because exposing is possible tumor antigens to the immune system and then attracting the immune cells. The reason why I say that, even though we don't have full evidence that we have one patient-derived models that have MAPK1 mutation, and uh, when we graph onto mice, uh, even though it's not full immune active mice, but we do see the tumor growing and then being stagnant. And then the tumor was actually having a lot of uh, inflammation in the tumor. But since that is not really a fully uh, immunoactive mice, so, so we just didn't publish data. But we do see one, and especially in Asia, we see these mutations being in a uh, recurrent, recurrent head and neck tumor, advanced head and neck tumor. The mutation rate of MAPK1 is actually higher in, in Hong Kong than in the TCGA cohort. So, uh, so, but there is definitely a lot to be studied. Uh, why is it causing? such a heavy immune infiltration in head and neck tumors. And uh, everybody knows that our head and neck tumors are uh, kind of immunogenic, you know, lesser than melanoma, but it's still quite immunogenic compared to other cancers, likely because of smoking and drinking uh, affirmations of the DNA. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for a fascinating talk and, um, and walking us through this. Um, it's seven o'clock, so we'll conclude the session, but I, I'll stay on. And if anybody else wants to stay on to ask uh, uh, Dr. Louie any questions, uh, please do. Um, but I uh, want to thank you again for sharing your work with us. Thank you very much, John. And thank you very much, everybody, for uh, staying that late for this grand round talk. I hope I will visit you all, uh, you know, maybe some, you know, maybe next year. That'd be great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, thank you, Queen. Thank you. Hey, Vivian, stay on for a second. I'll, I, I want to ask you a few more questions afterwards. Sure, sure. Yes, yes. John, you are actually doing a lot of research in head and neck and also melanoma, I noticed, and, and then also a lot of on the NK, the immune side of the uh, head and neck, right? Yeah, my, so my, my research is um, more focused on the immune response uh, to, to tumor cells. Um, uh, not so much in the genomics, although we, we do um, incorporate some of that work. We have some, we have some work related to NSD1, actually. You, you showed NSD1 mutations on your, on your um, graph. And um, as you know, it's an, a histomethyltransferase and it targets... Mm -hmm. 3K36. Um, so we've done some modeling similar to what you've done and shown that NSD1 mutations uh, actually can confer uh, an immune exclusion phenotype. Um, so, um, so I, those are those are the types of studies that we, that we do. Um, and I found I found what you did um, with the MAP kinase mutations very interesting. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I. Uh... 
uh, we were very hard on the story, and uh, you know, um, and we, it turned out that that study has turned out to be very fruitful because there are a lot of downstream uh, bioinformatics finding, um, then uh, and also expanded our way of harnessing the transcriptome further uh, into a multi-pathway approach. Uh, in fact, we are working on a pan pathway, even larger scale, uh, to look at uh, all possible uh, functional and therapeutic indications in, in head and neck cancer. So, uh, working hard on it during the COVID nineteen. <laughs> That's great. And so you were you were at uh, Pittsburgh with um, with Jenny Grandis, is that right? Yes, yes. I did my PhD in Pittsburgh, and then a postdoc, and then I was a research associate professor with Grand, uh, with Grandis, uh -huh. and uh, that's when we got funded by the two R01 on the PI3K, yeah. and also the uh, PTPR, which I did not have time. Uh, we published in, P, uh, in uh, PNAS on the PTPR mutation activating step three as a druggable target too. So yes, I've been with Jenny and uh, we're still co-working together right now across the ocean. <laughs> great, great. Fantastic. And, and, and you've, I, I missed it. So you've done uh, actual, some actual research with Quinn as well. You've worked together with Quinn. No, actually I, I know Quinn uh, during conferences. I so see. she is the some of the advisors from nasopharyngeal cancers uh, yeah. uh, studies back in Hong Kong. So we have this Gordon conference. You know, I met with her, and uh, that's why I know her. And then sometimes we met each other in the ACR and just chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. One of our residents, actually, um, our former residents in otolaryngology, his father. Um, was the founding chair of surgery at Chinese University. Um, Arthur oh. Lee, do you know Arthur Lee? Arthur uh, Lee, yes, yes, he's doing yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So Arthur, uh, Arthur Lee's son was one of our residents here in at Stanford. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I yeah. see, I see. So he's uh, with you under your team or? He, well, he's no longer, um, uh, he's not at Stanford anymore, but he was a former resident. He still lives in the area, um, but um, actually, I, I actually don't know what he's up to right now. I think he he was doing something with um, with uh, finance or venture oh. capital or something like that. Yeah. Okay, I yeah. see. I see. I see. That's interesting. I um, actually I was I, I visited Stanford uh, a few years ago. And uh, because my husband's uh, previous advisor, he's in, I think he's in the, he's a surgeon in the, of the urinary tract, I think it's the bladder related, you know. So uh, we visited him that time. Oh. It's a very nice area. <laughs> yeah, not, not right now. Now it's terrible with all the, the fires and everything. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, generally a, a be very beautiful place. So. It, is. Uh, it will get cleared out. I, I actually kind of see uh, Chris Holzinger here. Yeah. Do you know Chris? I know his name. I've never met him in person. Um, I I don't think I can see his face. Either. He must have stepped away. Hi, Chris. Yes, hey, yes. Chris, are, you, are you there? He might have stepped I, I saw his name uh, many times on publications. Yeah. <laughs> He, he he visits Asia quite a bit. He does a lot of uh, uh, speaking about transoral robotic surgery. So I see. I, I see. He's, um, he's in Asia quite quite often. Yes, I see. I see. So your your research work on so you 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 focus on the immune cell, the NK cells a lot, and is the NK cells going to help us in terms of therapy? Of the head and neck. Are, are you are you asking me? All right, or yes, yes, John. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think that I think there's definitely a therapeutic potential uh, for them. There are a lot of companies now working on adopt cell therapy of ex vivo expanded NK cells, and some of the some of the data looks really promising. 
there's a whole um, area on CAR NK cells, similar to CAR mm. T cells. Um, you know, most of that work is done with uh, hematologic malignancies as opposed to solid tumors. So yes. it, it'll remain to be, it remains to be seen whether or not the cells can get inside the tumors. Um, and so that's mm. one of our, our main interests is trying to understand what drives immune cells into this solid tumor microenvironment and what prevents them from getting in. And as I mentioned, um, one of our ideas is to look at NSD1 as a modulator of immune infiltration. I see, I see, I see. NSD1 mutation is somehow related to smoking, right? That's correct, yeah, that's correct. Uh, related to smoking. The other one, you know, it's interesting, you found HRAS is very um, common with immune inflamed tumors, right? Mm, yes. Yeah. So yes. Um, HRAS tends to co-occur with caspate. Uh, yes. And we have uh, we've been doing a lot of work studying caspate mutations, and um, and um, if you look in the TCGA, the caspate mutated tumors tend to be very inflamed, very hot tumors. And so we think we think it's a separate entity. Um, and, one of our, I don't know if Quinn told you, we're, we're putting together a SPORE grant. Um, it's a, it's a multi, um, it's like, it's almost like a, a program project grant, but with a translational clinical focus. And the, um, one of the projects is on caspate. I see, I see. Actually, uh, yeah, re you remind me, yes, HRAS is the only one that is, you know, really significant coexisting with caspase 8, um, you know, um, right now. And, uh, but in this case, we did not engineer the caspase seed mutation. So uh, I think there seems to be um, whether which one occurs first. And I always, I always have the suspicion that the caspase mutations are actually um, not just related to simple apoptosis feature that we are seeing because uh, in, in head and neck, um, even though there are uh, deleterious mutations of the caspase. And I always think that there are some other implications, probably, because I think Dan Johnson, together with Grandis, they published on caspase mutations right. in the head and neck. And uh, even though there is some effect, but it's not as what you would expect from just, uh, um, you know, uh, actually the activity that they're showing uh, with some mutant, um, it's not as uh, what, at least I expect it to be more, um, more, um, I mean, posting more of the effect on head and neck cancer because, you know, caspate 8 mutation is pretty high frequency in head and neck. And it's just on little survival differences that seems not to be the whole story. That's why I believe. Right. And in fact, if you have caspase defects, you could, affect the toll light receptor signaling and all these. So uh, I think if you look at the, um, our, actually we're preparing the pen pathway paper. We look at all cast phases together. We look at all cast phases together. We, you looked at all the what together? Yeah, um, we are, actually this is, um, this is pen pathway looking at 70. We're looking at 70 pathways not just in hand neck cancer, we're doing a pen cancer as well. But I put a lot of emphasis on hand neck cancer because you know this is what I'm doing. But what I see is uh, if you look at the whole cast basis together, it does have some immune indication. Hmm. It does, it does. I, so I don't think it's just survival, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so we're looking further into how, but there is, seems to be a lot of pathways uh, being different uh, for HPV positive and negative in terms of uh, uh, clinical indications mm -hmm. as well as new features. So we are, we are working on it. So there could be more on the cast basis, I always think. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'd love yeah. to talk to you more about it. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we could we should set up another call sometime and and see if there's anything we could collaborate on. 
yeah, sure, definitely, definitely. And I'd love to. And um, let's work out a time that we can chat more. And yeah. uh, yes. <laughs> Are you right now on campus or you're at home? I'm actually on campus. Yeah, I'm in my office oh. right now. So. Oh, you still have to travel home. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, um, uh, Quinn and I actually have a deadline in a couple of weeks. So we'll just, oh, my goodness. You know, we'll <laughs> yeah. so. Okay, okay. Yeah, so right. um, yes, let me know if you want to just chat again on, on possible collaborations or even discussions. Sounds great. Yes, yes. yes. Well, thanks again for, for sharing your work. Appreciate it. And um, you take care and we'll talk soon. Okay. You take care soon. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Don. Okay. Bye-bye.